So, uh, thank you. Uh, Stephanie is just saying all that because uh, at last, or a few years ago, I complained about having the slot between lunch, uh, between 11.30 before lunch, and she gave me the last slot. <laughs> so all that is sort of made up. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. Um, and really, um, I know this is the last talk, so I, we don't have to go too dim on the lights. Uh, this is fine. But uh, I changed my talk just a few days ago uh, when I spoke to Dr. Coulter, when she really um, asked me to kind of give an update of where we stand now in the new trials. And uh, I hope you indulge me because I decided I would go on a more historical thing, uh, a more historical tour of our landscape, which is again a dangerous thing to do with the last lecture. So I'm going to actually start way back in the beginning for cardiovascular outcomes. And I just want you to think for a minute where you were in 1970. If you just think for a second. You know, there were a lot of, of big things going on at that time. You know, the Beatles broke up in 1970. The computer floppy disk was introduced, so these big events. Lo oh, Richard Nixon was the 37th president of the United States. So, okay. no, no editorial comments there. And locally, the clinical facilities and hospital staff for Baylor, my institution and our institution, and the Methodist Hospital affiliated, no longer together, divorced. And the TMC board approved deeding 5.5 acres of land to the University of Texas as, as the site of the new medical school in Houston. So big changes here in Houston. So I worked really hard to try and find a picture of a cardiologist who would go on to give a series of successful lectures, a women's advocate in healthcare, and a series of successful lectures. And today I find she wears tights to work, or stockings to work. <laughs> Not really her, but. I fought, worked hard to do it. <laughs> so really in 1970, I think when we think about cardiovascular outcome trials, and we think about, um, in general, the first diabetes outcome trials, or the first randomized controlled trial that I can think of was actually published, and that is the University Group Diabetes Program. This was a North American study, which was uh, started in 1961 to 1969, that had a little over 1,000 individuals in five groups. First randomized trial, placebo, Tobutamide, which was a sulfonylurea, fenformin, which is a precursor to metformin, insulin in fixed dose, and insulin in adjusted dose. Yeah, no, no, this is great, right? And so Dr. Koch said we haven't gotten very far. I had to walk to the library to get this uh, and make a copy um, because it's not electronic. But if you look at this, um, this is just the editorial that accompanied the main outcome, and I'll just read it. It says, for some time, differences of opinion have existed as to where, whether or not the vascular complications of diabetes mellitus can be postponed or prevented by control of the blood sugar in these patients. So in 1970, we're asking the same question we're asking in 2016. So we haven't gotten that far. So this is actually the glucose control in the, in the trial. Now if you look, there are four curves. There's one placebo. There's one tolbutamide, which is a sulfonylurea. There's insulin in standard dose and insulin in, um, I wonder if this works, in the variable dose. Now you remember that I said that there were five arms to the UGDP, and fitformin doesn't make it, right? It doesn't make it to the finish line. It stopped early because of, this con because of lactic acidosis and adverse outcomes. So medicine that lowered glucose but had an off-target effect that had to be stopped. So this is a common theme as we go forward, that we're learning this lesson that although we can lower glucose, you know, we, have to, we may not be doing the right thing. So if we look forward at the outcomes, we can see that, that again, this disconnect that exists. We can lower glucose successfully, but do we get the outcomes we want? And so this is cardiovascular mortality in this study published in 1970. And one can see that right off the bat, that tolbutamide, a first-generation sulfonylurea, had increased mortality to the other three arms. So an interesting finding, again, we lowered glucose, but there was this mortality signal, again, explained by different uh, sort of hand-waving things, but no one really knew what had happened. Maybe it was a statistical issue, a methodological issue with the study. Now, I want to fast forward now to the mid-90s in the UK PDS study, because it does provide some interesting information. As you remember, UKPDS was a study of patients who had newly diagnosed diabetes. 
About 2% of them had heart disease, and they were randomized to intensive versus standard glucose control, intensive being around a hemoglobin A1C of 7. In that arm, there, in the study, there was also a small sub-study where obese patients were randomized either to sulfonylurea or insulin versus metformin, and the outcomes are shown on this slide. So what we see is that metformin was associated with a statistically significant reduction in myocardial infarction as well as in total mortality, albeit there were a small number of individuals who were enrolled in this study, a little over 350, 340 individuals who, were, who really were part of this study. Now this is again interesting because in that metformin group, they actually didn't have lower blood glucose in the sulfonylurea insulin. In fact, sulfonylurea and insulin was somewhat lower than metformin, but we saw this cardiovascular benefit. And indeed, metformin, in part related to this, remains first-line therapy for people with diabetes in the hopes that it also has cardiovascular risk protection. Now on this historical tour, if you let me just go forward just a little bit more, I want to take you now to the mid-90s. In the mid-90s, I was a hotshot uh, medical student and intern, and you know, at that time, if you think back, what people were dying of when we were rounding as students, they were dying of AIDS, right? They were dying of AIDS, and there was this huge political push that the drugs to treat AIDS were, were being slowed as far as approval in the FDA, that approval was too slow and people were dying, so the FDA decided, well, we need to fast track so we can get these drugs to market. And so the first drug ever approved on this fast, or this rapid fast track approval happens to be a first-in-class medicine that treats the underpinnings of diabetes, that treats insulin resistance, a TZD. Troglitazone, not AIDS, not HIV medicines, but really a diabetic medicine, and that was troglitazone. So approved in 1996 and actually um, began use in March of 1997 in the U.S. Very successful drug, again, first-in-class. It captures 12% of the U.S. market for oral agents for diabetes. Shortly thereafter, it's launched in the UK, but then we start to see trouble. In December 1997, there's 135 cases of liver toxicity as well as six deaths, and it's withdrawn from the UK markets. At the same time, historically, there's a study going on, the Diabetes uh, Prevention Program, which had lifestyle, metformin, as well as troglitazone arms, and it's withdrawn from the study because there was a death in the study. So the NIDD case stops it. But it continues here in the U.S. For, until the March of 2000 when it's pulled off the market. And so during this time, a very successful drug, right? TCTs are, are very good as far as treating insulin resistance and improving HDL, reducing triglycerides, improving glucose. There are 94 patients who had liver failure with 66 deaths in the U.S. So it's a lesson. Again, we have a medicine. It's successful at lowering glucose, but it has an off-target effect that was unanticipated. And, and, and um, although very financially successful for, I believe it was GSK. So finally, as we think of the landscape, this I think was really what kind of changed everything. So we had these lessons, and this is a meta-analysis that was published in the um, New England Journal in 2007 from Steve Nissen, where he looked at rosiglitazone, uh, compiled some data that's been heavily criticized for some methodologic issues. But nonetheless, this issue that rosiglitazone, again very commonly used, may increase the risk of myocardial infarction and cardiovascular death. So we had a series of studies which had shown that there were potential adverse effects to some of these medications that can lower glucose. Now around the same time, these studies of intensive glucose control come out, Accord, Advance, and VADT. These are the studies that said, hey, we know that high glucose is bad for cardiovascular disease. What if we lower it to near normal? Can we reduce CV mortality? Can we reduce um, cardiovascular outcomes? And these outcomes are shown here on the slide for Accord, Advance, and VADT. In each of the studies, there was around a 1 to 1.5% 1 difference in hemoglobin A1C. But one can see that despite achieving this glucose difference, we didn't actually improve cardiovascular outcomes in this group of individuals. Much to our surprise, and in fact, Accord was stopped prematurely because more people died in the intensive arm than those individuals who were treated uh, with standard therapy. And so lots of reasons why this happened, you know. These patients had diabetes for a long time, they had complications, and perhaps it was just too late. And then there's this issue of perhaps maybe the medicines that we're using just aren't very good to get them where they need to be. Perhaps the adverse effects related to hypoglycemia, to weight gain, outweigh any benefits that we see with um, glucose lowering. So we have that issue with pharmacotherapy. 
And at the same time, we have this explosion in the number of people who have diabetes in the U.S. Again, if you start when the uh, UDGP study starts in, in 1960 and you go to 2009, you can see this remarkable increase over time in diabetes. And so it's increasing. And then we see that this health burden, you know, despite how we treat it, despite our improvements in blood pressure control and lipid lowering uh, therapy, that there's just this disconnect that exists or this discrepancy in survival between those individuals with and without diabetes. This is for men and this is for women just showing that the presence of diabetes shifts survival curves downward and leftward. So despite our improvements in how we treat people, this survival is impacted and continues to um, be part of that. And then finally, as we set the landscape, we have this explosion of new therapies that become available. These are uh, um, listed from the recent diabetes care and doesn't include insulin, but we can see there's the baguanides, sulfonylureas, uh, the TZDs, DPP-4 inhibitors, and the different medicines that are available, GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGL-2 inhibitors, and a variety of other medicines that are now available to treat type 2 diabetes. So it's all of this that really influences the landscape. The unrecognized off-target effects of diabetic medications, the finding that improvement in glycemic control, A1C, is not necessarily concordant with CV risk reduction, and the clinical burden of diabetes continues to grow, as well as the surge in hyperglycemic therapies. And it's in this setting that the FDA says, no more, no mas, we can't do that anymore. So in 2008, the FDA said, we're not going to allow this to happen, you know, all these signals. So it says that if you're in industry, you have to study these drugs in people who are high risk for cardiovascular disease, and it's not good enough just to lower glucose, but you have to show that they're safe in these individuals in whom they're going to be used. And this led to this explosion of clinical cardiovascular outcome studies that are now being ongoing and now being completed. These are actually um, seven studies that have been published in the last year and a half to two years, which are part of these CV outcome trials, looking at medications not to lower glucose, but can these medicines, are they safe? First, it's non-inferiority, and two, are they effective at lowering cardiovascular disease in people who have diabetes and who either who have established disease or are high risk for disease? And so we have a few, and I'm going to go over the last three in a little more detail, but we have them for the DPP-4 inhibitors, saxagliptin, alagliptin, and citagliptin. We have clinical trials for the GLP-1 agonists, lixisenatide, liraglutide, and semaglutide, which is not commercially available. And then we have an SGL2 inhibitor and Biclofloxacin. Now again, these are non-inferiority studies predominantly. That's how they're powered. That's what the FDA said. First show is it's as good as and safe um, compared to placebo. And we can see that for these studies, they met their non-inferiority outcome. But more recently, we see some promise that indeed there may be some benefit associated with these medications to lower CVD uh, relative to placebo. One of our research interests has been in heart failure hospitalization, and we can, we'll show this in more detail. Again, there may be some hope. But again, if we just look at saxagliptin, no one ever thought that this medicine might be associated with greater rates of heart failure until we did the clinical study. So let me turn now to the clinical outcome studies, and I'm going to start with the SGL2 inhibitor um, and empagliflozacin in the EMPA-REG study. So I, I know you're familiar with this, but just as a reminder, the SGL2 receptors uh, is in the proximal tubule of the kidney, and it inhibits the glucose sodium co-transporter, uh, causing glucosuria as well as naturesis in the kidney. So this uh, receptor is upregulated in people with diabetes, it inhibits it. And so there's loss of urinary glucose excretion as well as some degree of sodium. Now the SGL2 inhibitors are associated in general with a hemoglobin A1C reduction of about 0.7%. Because of the glucosuria and probably naturesis, there's modest effects in blood pressure, 5 and 3 millimeters. There are modest weight loss um, felt to be to the energy imbalance or caloric imbalance as you have glucosuria, as well as reductions in plasma volume. So what is the EMPA-REG study? The EMPA-REG study was a study to examine the, the long-term effects of empa versus placebo on cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in 7,020 patients who had type 2 diabetes and who were high risk for cardiovascular disease. These include patients who had a prior MI, coronary disease, stroke, unstable angina, or occlusive PAD. 
they are randomized one to one to one to either 10 milligrams of EMPA, 25 milligrams of EMPA, or placebo, and they were followed for a median of approximately three years. And these are the primary outcomes that were published last year, um, <clears throat> which show that EMPA reg is associated with a significant reduction in the primary outcome of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, or stroke, with a hazard ratio of 0.86. And we can see, if we look at the survival curves, that indeed this begins to separate early. Now, if we look at the individual components, the predominant component that drove it in that outcome was cardiovascular death, which is shown in here. So for really, this study for the first time showed that there was a medicine that was associated with CV, reduced CV death in patients who had diabetes. This is another way of looking at that composite outcome, looking at the three-point um, MACE outcome that we discussed. Again, CV death was the one that was significantly reduced. And, and indeed, when we look at the other two outcomes, non-fatal myocardial infarction, as well as non-fatal stroke, the atherosclerotic outcomes, we didn't see any uh, a benefit, that there was some heterogeneity that existed within those endpoints. So moving forward, looking at uh, something that we've been interested in studying from a personal research area is the effect that it had on heart failure. Again, an unexpected finding that there was a 35% reduction in the hazard ratio for heart failure with EMPA reg relative to placebo. And again, interesting because these curves begin to separate very early, right? Very early relative to, for example, statins or even blood pressure medicines. You know, the, the curves just really go apart. And then finally, total mortality, again, mirrored cardiovascular mortality and was reduced with EMPA reg relative to placebo. So for this study, the primary outcome really seemed to be driven by CV mortality with no difference in MI and stroke. The EMPA and placebo curves began to separate early, approximately three months and even sooner for heart failure. There was no heterogeneity between the different doses between 10 and 25 as far as the CV mortality endpoint or the CV outcomes. Marked reduction in heart failure events and in adverse events in general was well tolerated. The biggest adverse event was genital infection was increased with EMPA relative to placebo, and this was more common in women. So we were left with this unexpected finding, you know, why is that? And I think, the, you know, why is an SGL2 inhibitor reducing cardiovascular mortality? And I think the answer to that, no one really knows. There's been several proposed mechanisms, you know, what could be going on with it related to metabolic changes, blood pressure changes, uh, myocardial energetics, structure, function, and kidney, and I just want to go over that and maybe one by one uh, just look at the different possibilities and at the end of the day I'm going to say I just don't really know what happened. Um, so first let's talk about glycemic control. Was what The benefit we saw actually related because it controlled blood sugar better. Well it did control blood sugar better. You can see here's placebo. EMPA 10 is in purple. EMPA 25 is in blue. And you can see that over the difference there were modest differences and A1C, 0.45 and 0.28. So very small differences that you see. And, and we saw in the other studies that glucose controlled, where you got differences of one to one and a half, it didn't make that much of a difference in mortality. So I think that this difference in glucose control is probably not the reason that we saw the benefit. What about potential effects on blood pressure? I told you earlier that it can affect blood pressure. So here we see that in general, um, the EMPA-10 and EMPA-25 had similar blood pressure uh, control, probably related because they, EMPA-10 um, provides its maximum naturesis as uh, EMPA-25. But you can see despite a change of 5 to 2 millimeters in systolic and diastolic blood pressure, that the, um, th there's no change in heart rate. So there's a difference, but there's no change. But these differences are modest, 5 and 2 millimeters. In Accord, blood pressure, if you go back and think about diabetes, those differences were 10 millimeters and we didn't see an outcome. So again, I don't think 5 and 2 millimeters really explain this difference as well. I think probably the most interesting part of this medicine is perhaps it had some effect on kidney and some effect on volume reclamation and, um, and renal hemodynamics. And if you'll spare me, I'll just go through this a little bit. It, um, so normally we have uh, glucose filtration as well as, and there's sodium and glucose reabsorption that occurs in the proximal tubule. When you have diabetes, there's hyperfiltration that occurs. We know this is a hallmark of diabetic kidney disease, is hyperfiltration really related to a tubular glomerular uh, filtration pressure gradient. So in people who have diabetes, they have increased sodium and glucose reabsorption, 
So there is in decreased sodium delivery to the macula densa. So when, they, the, when the kidney senses this decreased sodium delivery, what it does is it causes afferent, you know, it thinks it needs to dilate, so it causes afferent arterial vasodilation, which in turn will essentially lead to more hyperfiltration in people with kidney disease. So what some uh, elegant investigators have shown was, in fact, in people when you use SGL2 inhibitors, that you have increased sodium delivery to the macula densa, so you have more sodium going downstream because those co-transporters reduce, and in turn there's a feedback that causes afferent arterial constriction, which reduces tumular, this uh, tubular glomerular filtration, so there's decreased uh, filtration that may occur within the kidney. And so this may explain some of the differences that we can see, and in fact, in uh, just a publication a few months ago, when we looked at Empareg again, you saw that people who were treated with Empareg had improved not only cardiovascular outcomes, but had improved renal function over time. This is the incidence of um, incident or worsening nephropathy in EMPA in red and placebo in gray, and we can see some marked reductions in the hazard ratio associated with EMPA. So perhaps it's something related to cardiorenal that we're seeing related to heart failure that in turn may have something to do with cardiovascular mortality. I'm sure that cardiorenal was discussed in part this morning with heart failure with preserved EF where it may play a, a bigger role. And finally, there's the issue with heart failure that maybe we're just seeing some fancy diuretic, that people are losing uh, volume in patients who may predispose to heart failure, that they may have stiffer ventricles, and indeed, if we cause a little more diuresis, that we'll see improved heart failure outcomes. I think that may be helpful for heart failure, but I don't think that explains cardiovascular mortality because the diuretics in really that we use for treatment of heart failure, as we heard in the previous lecture, really aren't associated with improved mortality. They're really associated with improved symptoms. This is just showing that, the, that you get hemoconcentration, which we think may be in due part related to um, um, uh, diuresis or hemoconcentration. So that's possible. So, just, so I, you know, I'll say that I, we really don't know why we saw that benefit, but despite that, last week, last week, December 2nd, I'm really behind in my Christmas shopping. <laughs> it's moving really quick. I think that was last week. The FDA made a big, big change. The, you, for the first time, the FDA approved a medication, a new indication for empaglyphosin to not reduce glucose, but re to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death in adult patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus and CV disease, which is a big step for the FDA. And I think we still have to, I mean, just sort of hot off the presses. And how we deal with this in the future, I don't know as far as treatment algorithms. So I want to finish um, just with the last two studies as far as GLP-1 agonists. Again, I know this audience is familiar with them, but just as point of review, the G GLP-1 is secreted uh, in the intestine when we ingest food. GLP-1 causes insulin secretion, uh, decreases uh, satiety, it reduces appetite, it uh, decreases gastric motility, increase, uh, decreases glucagon um, production all fail to have the glycemic effects that we know are part of GLP-1 agonists. We know that DPP-4 inhibitors inhibit the enzyme that break GLP-1 and that's how they work. So here's GLP-1 as far as their um, metabolic effects. But there's a, a lot of literature suggesting that perhaps GLP-1s have a potential cardiovascular effects. This is actually a publication that we published five years ago uh, looking at, uh, just summarizing some of the effects, uh, some of the studies that were available, both animal models as well as some clinical studies, looking at the effects that GLP-1 had on blood pressure, modest effects on blood pressure, as well as weight, some human studies on endothelial dysfunction, heart failure, MI, and ischemia reperfusion. And when we published the study, we thought it was a good paper. I worked hard on it. I actually probably never thought it was true. <laughs> but, but when we look at it, I think we see some promise. In fact, the study that really um, showed that there may be some benefit beyond just glucose control is the LEADER study, which was um, the, a study of liraglutide in cardiovascular outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes. It took a little over 9,000 individuals with type 2 diabetes who were high CV risk and randomized them to 1.8 milligrams of liraglutide or, or Victoza 
versus placebo. Included people with renal dysfunction, which was a unique uh, aspect to this study because they're often excluded and, and, and treatment options are limited in that group. Again, the primary outcome was similar to all the studies. It was a MACE outcome, followed for 3.8 years. The average age was 64, 35% women, and 82% had established cardiovascular disease. And these are the outcomes. Um, here on the left is the primary outcome, the MACE outcome. And we can see that there was a 13% reduction in the primary MACE outcome with liraglutide compared to placebo. If we look over, these outcomes, again, looking at death from cardiovascular uh, causes, the hazard ratio was 0 0.78. Again, statistically significant favoring liraglutide. Non-fatal myocardial infarction trended in the same direction, but was not significant, and there was no difference in non-fatal stroke as far as their outcomes. So other observations in LEADER is that A1C, when we look again, looking for explanations or differences between the groups, hemoglobin A1C was reduced modestly in the group. I don't, there wasn't a huge difference when you compared them at the end of the study. There was modest weight uh, loss associated with liraglutide as well as minor changes in blood pressure, albeit statistically significant. Again, there's a signal that there's lower rates of nephropathy that occurred with liraglutide compared to placebo in the study. For those of you who use GLP-1 agonists, you know that the most common adverse effect is uh, nausea, vomiting, and some of the GI effects, and th that was increased in the liraglutide group compared to placebo. And I think what probably doesn't make the sound bite, but we do have to keep an eye on it, is there was this numerically greater pancreatic cancer that was seen with liraglutide versus placebo. It was 13 versus 5, a p-value of 0 0.6. And I think we'll just need to keep an eye on this signal. There's always been a concern about uh, the effects of GLP-1 on pancreatitis, pancreatic cancer, medullary cancer. This is the first time I think that I can see from a randomized trial where there does seem to be this imbalance. So I think we'll have to look at this in the future as we move forward. And I think it echoes what we heard about at the beginning that with these medications, we really have to be concerned about off-target effects. No one should really die today from a treatment of type 2 diabetes from a medicine related to it when we have so many options. So we need just to keep an eye on that. And then finally, the last study that I want to mention is uh, published uh, last month in the New England Journal, which was a study of semaglutide. Unlike liraglutide, the semaglutide is, is currently not approved. It's uh, similar to exenatide or bidurian, which is a once-weekly injection, so it has a long half-life. This study was smaller, uh, around uh, 3,300 patients with diabetes and high CV risk and again, uses uh, different things, 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, 0.5 milligrams or 1 milligrams once weekly of semaglutide or placebo. So they were matched. Again, the primary outcome was cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke, and a shorter study. This was 2.1 years. Again, it was primarily a non-inferiority study. But when we look at it, and we look again at the primary outcome, we can see with this long-acting GLP-1 agonist that there was improvement in the... Um, so the, the outcome was lower in the semaglutide arm relative to placebo. Again, a, a, a novel finding uh, in these studies. Non-fatal myocardial infarction trended to be lower. In this study, non-fatal stroke was lower compared to placebo, and death from cardiovascular <coughs> causes were similar. But again, if we look at the primary outcome, again, a benefit in this most recent study. There were differences in the two arms as far as A1C. The semaglutide 10, there actually was no difference between the two doses as far as cardiovascular outcomes, but there were some differences that are shown on this, on this slide related to A1C, weight, blood pressure, as well as heart rate. So we do see some differences related to the medications. It did affect hemoglobin A1C, but the cardiovascular outcomes were similar in both studies. Uh, so this is just a reminder again that, again, when we read these studies, we have to go beyond just the um, primary outcome and we really have to look at adverse effects. And there was um, an unexpected signal that was seen with retinopathy with this uh, medication. Now we know that there are lots of tests that occur, you know, there are lots of outcomes that are looked at. And so whether this is just a play of chance or whether it's real, it's unclear, but nonetheless, uh, when we look at the incidence per 100 person years, semaglutide had a greater incidence of retinopathy complications relative to placebo, a hazard ratio 1.76. So again, no free lunch and we need to keep uh, an eye on these outcomes.
So I think I'm, that's going to stop here and really um, thank you for your attention. The, you know, we think about the landscape of diabetes and cardiovascular disease, it has been shaped by multiple factors, including the continued and growing burden of diabetes and CVD, the realization of potential off-target hazards of antihyperglycemic medications beginning in the 1970s and continuing to last month, the notion that we have a large number of treatment options available today, many choices, both between classes as well as within classes, and that there has been some promise. Really, what, in, in my field of what we do research, this is really remarkable. That for once we're actually seeing drugs that have promise as far as reducing CVD, which is still the number one reason why people with diabetes die. But we definitely need future studies to define optimal treatment strategies and algorithms and decide what medicines we use first and when and in what combination. So thank you.